were here last Sunday, what do you remember? What do you remember about our emphasis? Celebration. Celebration. Got a little excited last Sunday. For me anyway, publicly, got a little excited for all the reason that we have to celebrate. But I want to I want to start this morning in a little different way, and that is to ask you, do you ever wish things had worked differently? Do you ever things you ever, you ever wish things would have would have gone a little a little differently? Either in the way that the path they took or the way in which they they came about. I think a lot of us do. Some call that regret. Sometimes it involves guilt. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it happens in ways we didn't see coming. Other times we are, unfortunately, willing participants in the way it goes. Oftentimes we look back and we wish things had been different. When we look at the the letter to the Ephesians that Paul wrote, and that's where we are this morning, so if you want to open up your, uh, your Bible, if you brought a Bible with you, or if you have access on your, one of your devices, I invite you to turn there. If you're with us by video, we invite you to do the same. We're in Ephesians, we're in chapter 1 this morning, uh, and we'll be in chapter 2. It's always helpful, at least to me, maybe it is to you, but I'm trying to understand what I'm reading. I'm trying to get, get a handle on, on what is meant and how it applies to my life, to have a little background, to have a little understanding of, of maybe why something was written that way. The challenge with Ephesians is that it's a general letter. We don't know the specific context. So I can't tell you this morning exactly why this letter was written. Encouragement, yes. Thanks and praise, yes. Some, some challenge, yes. But the specific situation, we don't know like we do some of the other writings. I started this out by asking you if, there, if you ever wish things would have turned out a little differently. And i tell you why I asked you that, because when I begin to read in, in chapter 1, verse 15, I hear these words and it makes me wonder what's behind them. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom, or the spirit of wisdom, and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, so that you can understand this confident hope, the confident hope He has given to those He called, His holy people, who are His rich and glorious inheritance. So why is Paul writing this? Why is, he, why is he expressing this? It's obviously an encouraging word. If we're the recipients, if we're hearing this letter, if it's written to us and we hear him say, ever since I first heard of your strong faith and your love, I've not stopped thanking God. Well, who wouldn't be, who wouldn't be thrilled about that? Who wouldn't be excited to know that someone else is recognizing what's going on in you and they're thanking God for it? But you kind of wonder, wonder, what, what's behind this? What in particular has happened? And when he says, ever since I first heard, does that indicate that this had been going on and Paul just heard about it? Or does this indicate that this is a newer thing occurring? You kind of wonder. When I think about when I think about us, when I think about me and my life, and I try to hear these words, when I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus, I wonder, would someone have written a letter to me like that? Would someone somewhere along the line have been able to write to me 
and say, ever since I first heard read of your strong faith in the Lord, I've not stopped thanking God. And then I wonder, well, if they had written a letter like this, if they had acknowledged that my strong faith was in the Lord, and that I had strong faith in the Lord, when would that have been? How long ago? Because I mentioned to you, for those of you who were here months ago, that, that I've been in the church all my life. My parents were Christian. I was brought up in the church. It's, it's not like I came to the Lord late in life. I grew up in the church. So I wonder, would somebody have, have thanked God for my strong faith when I was a little child? Or would it have been maybe in my, my teenage years? Yeah, boy, that causes some rumbles, doesn't it? When I think about teenage years, I don't know what you think about, but I think about my teenage years, I'm seeing some grins on faces, and I'm thinking, mm, I wonder if, God would have, if someone would have thanked God for anything in my teenage years. <laughs> or would it have happened maybe after school? Would it have happened as I began my adult life? It's kind of struck out on my own, you know? You, you leave the the comforts and the security of your, your home with your, your parents, your grandparents, whoever you grew up with, where would it have happened, if it happened, that it would have been noticeable to such that someone would have written or maybe called or today they would have emailed, maybe even texted me and said, I thank God for your strong faith in the Lord Jesus. Now he goes on to add to that. If my wondering about this strong faith, if, I, if I'm wondering, first of all, would someone have ever been able to write that? And obviously hoping they would. But then also wondering, well, when might that have occurred? When might it have been and been evident to someone? Then I hear this. Because there's an and in this sentence. It's not just the recipients of this letter. It's not just their strong faith in the Lord Jesus that Paul's thanking them for. And I wonder if this could have been said about me. Again, I'm still in verse 15. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere. Wow. Okay, if that first part was challenging, <laughs> if that per first part made me wonder, would someone have been able to, to acknowledge, see evidence, see the fruit of my strong faith, and they would have written to thank me? To, to tell me that they were thanking God? Would they have been able to say, and... Your love for God's people everywhere? You remember a few minutes ago when I asked you, you ever wish things would have worked differently? I've not stopped thanking God for your love for God's people everywhere. <sighs> hmm. Let that sit for a minute. And just listen as I continue to read. This is what else Paul said. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He called. The confident hope. Are we a people of confident hope? Do you have confident hope such that it is not just something you answer in a question asked in church, but it's something you could answer at any time, asked by anybody, anywhere? You have confident hope? For we are His holy people. 
who are His rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and then seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Not only in this world, but in the one to come. Okay, i got to go back over that again for a minute. For me, and maybe you need to hear it. So listen again. He's praying that we will understand. He's praying that the Ephesians will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. The power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in a position above everything else all authority over everyone in every time and every place, not only in this world, but in the world to come. But I left out a part in there. Did you catch it? I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. And then He says, the power that raised Christ from the dead. Do you grasp that? Because I asked you if you have that kind of confident hope. I asked you if you carry that with you. God's mighty power, the incredible greatness of God's power for us. Well, what mighty power? The same power that raised Christ from the dead. I run those two things together and I think, okay, if I'm you, and I'm answering the preacher, do I have confident hope? Do I have confident hope understanding that God's incredible power, the greatness of His power given to me, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Do I understand that that kind of power was given to me in the first place? <coughs> really? I mean, I don't, I don't mean just in church. I don't mean just so that I can be saved. I don't mean just so that I can go to heaven someday. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a timed issue. Well, I'm giving you this gift, but you can't open it till Christmas, right? That's, that's not what he's talking about here. He didn't say, I'm giving you this power, but it's not available to you yet. You've got to hang on for a while. See, I know you, and you've got to work a little bit more. You've got to do a few more things. You're not quite ready for this power yet. I'm going to be watching you, and when you're ready, I'll give it to you. You know, we tell children that, right? Well, you can't have this yet, son. Dad, but I'd love that yet, but you can't have it yet. We'll wait and see. He doesn't say that. The incredible greatness of God's power given to us, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and that seated Him above everything else. Why is that part important? Isn't it enough? Don't we just celebrate the resurrection? Isn't that enough for us Christians? I mean, who do you know that's been raised from the dead, right? I mean, we go down that old, there's a whole sermon on that. There's a whole series of sermons on that. But let's, let's move beyond that and say, isn't that enough? Why does, why does he feel the need to go on and say not just that he raised him from the dead, but then what? He seated him on the throne above everything else. Wow. I mean, if that's true, It would sound funny for me to say that. Well, I call myself there. If that's true, read it. It's a Bible, man. You're a preacher, really. <laughs> yeah, but I'm also, you know, we, we live life in between Sundays. Amen. If I believe that, that, it, that He raised Him from the dead and He seated Him above everything else, who? 
Jesus. Yeah, but what's his relationship to me? Well, I believe in him. Well, what do I believe? Well, that God raised him from the dead and therefore he's my Savior, but he's also my Lord. So we've got this relationship. And then I go back up and I read before because it's like a book, you know, that's just power-packed full of stuff. And I'm trying to grasp it because I feel like it's really saying something awesome. But it's so so packed that i gotta, I got to keep backing up and reading a little bit. Okay, wait a minute. Let me go back over this again. Do I have this? I pray for you constantly asking God to give you the spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in the knowledge, in your knowledge of God that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope He has given you. Okay, that hope has something to do with who He is. That hope has something to do with what He's going on to tell me, that, that God raised Him from the dead and seated Him above all else. So do I have that kind of confident hope? Well, how is it hope? How is it confident hope for you and me? I mean, okay, so Jesus was raised from the dead and He's seated at the right hand of God. He's seated on the throne above all else. Okay, I get that. Okay, He saved me. We're, we're going to go to heaven. Okay, I got that. But what's, what's, he, what's Paul pushing at here? Why, why do I need spiritual wisdom? Why do I need insight? Why do I need to know God better? Why do I need to be flooded with light? Because maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's somehow this, this whole thing about He's above every ruler and every authority and every power and every leader. He's above every temptation. He's above every challenge. He's above every difficulty. He's above every struggle. He's above every brokenness. He's above every crack in the, in the foundation. He's above the things you can't control. He's above the things you don't understand. He's above the things that you have worked at and worked at and worked at and you cannot solve them. He's above everything. And you know that relationship you can't get past? You know that person that you just don't understand? And your life would be a whole lot better off if you could just like maybe not have that relationship. Or you could just like avoid those people. He's above that too. Not just above that person. He's above the relationship. He's above me in that relationship. Okay, that doesn't have anything necessarily to do with me getting to heaven. So what does it have to do with? Paul goes on, he says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Does he say the church? Hmm. And the church is His body. It's made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with Himself. Wow, Paul, you're over my head now. I don't know where you are. And the church is His body. Okay, I get that. And He's been made head over it. Okay, now i got to ask you just to listen for a minute because I need to read a long passage to you to kind of get it where we're going. Can I do that? So now I'm going to read in chapter 2 and I'm going to read the first 10 verses. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You know, that applies to every one of us. Yeah, got it. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Those, you know, those other people. All of us used to live that way. Hmm. Paul was a really good and faithful Jew. You know that, right? Paul grew up this way. 
Paul had always been a part of God's people. And he was educated and he went on to be one of the, one of the top. I mean, he was really a leader in the Jewish faith. All of us used to live that way. See, I know I wasn't a part of the original audience that this was written to, but, but Paul was writing this, and Paul says all of us, so he's including himself, and he says all of us used to live that way. So you look at a guy like me who grew up in the church, and I think, okay, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. He's the Spirit. He's the Spirit at work in our hearts. All of us used to live that way. This refusing to obey God. The following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Okay, I get that. If I'm living sinfully, I'm, I'm subject, subject to God's anger. But all of us, all of us used to live that way. We were all dead in our sin. Thankfully, the letter doesn't stop there. And he goes on to say, But God is so rich in mercy and He loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. Let me read that again. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Are you seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? Am I? What does that mean? Because I'm standing right here in front of you. And you're seated right there in front of me. And I know a lot of you. I don't know all of you. And you're getting to know me. Are we seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? Maybe Paul's just talking here, you know. Maybe he's just gotten excited. Maybe he's kind of carried away. You know, you get carried away when you're, you're writing or you're telling a story, you know, and you just kind of, and then somebody checks you and you're like, oh, okay, what did you mean by that? Uh, well, I got a little carried away. I don't think he got carried away. He's building an argument. He's been saying something he's trying to get us to understand. And he's arrived at this place where he says, you were all dead in your sin." But Christ has raised you from the dead. God has raised you from the dead and He seated you with Christ in the heavenly realms. What does that mean? And more than what does it mean, what are the implications? What does that mean now? What does that mean for you? What does that have to do with the, the confident hope that he's praying for, that we would better understand? What does that have to do with what does that have to do with the authority that he's been given? And that we are raised with him and we're seated with him. What is he telling us? Down in verse 8. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. Well, no kidding. Right? I mean, who, who in the world would take credit for that? It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. And then this. He, God, created us anew in Christ Jesus 
so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Somehow all of this is leading up to that. Somehow this, this strong faith that the people of the church in Ephesus or, or wherever, the, the, the people in that area that, that Paul was writing to, all the strong faith he had in Jesus, all the, the spiritual wisdom and insight that he was praying for, the confident hope that God has given us, that we are seated with Jesus who has all authority over everything, everywhere, so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. What good things? What good things? I asked you if you ever wish things would have worked out a little differently. I've been in the church as long as I can remember. I don't mean to say that my understanding of Jesus has always been the same. That'd be rather foolish for me to tell you that. Because it would either indicate that I knew everything as a little child, which would be really stupid to tell you, or it would mean that I've not grown any in my knowledge since then. So thankfully, I can tell you I have grown. But I wish things would have worked out a little differently. Because as I was getting to know Jesus, and as I was understanding that He saved me and that He's under... He's undertaken what He only could undertake in order for me to be saved and get to heaven that I in fact wasn't going to spend all of eternity where I didn't want to go. I didn't get what this meant for me here and now, early on. I didn't, I didn't get how this, this authority that Jesus has been given well, I didn't get that I was seated with Him in the heavenly realms. I didn't get that at all. I'm still wrestling with that one. But for the little bit that I can grasp of it, and the little bit that I'm asking you to grasp this morning, that God raised Him from the dead by the same power that He has made available to us. And He used that power to then seat Jesus on the throne above all else with all authority and then He seated us there with Him. And I could really go down a wrong path here, right? By thinking, oh great, that means we've got all authority. Super, that's going to make tomorrow easier. Except that I know what Jesus did with His power. What did He do? He gave up His life for us. That's what it all led to. And then I go back and I read the first part of this passage and the last part, because a lot of times when I read a book, if I'm really trying to get it, and it's really complicated stuff, sometimes I just have to go back and I read the very beginning and the very end, and I try to put together the stuff in the middle. And at the very beginning, he thanked them for their strong faith he thanked God for their strong faith in Jesus and for their love for God's people everywhere. And then at the end of this part of the story, He said we were created anew in Christ Jesus so we could do the good things He had planned for us long ago. If I'm seated and you're seated in the heavenly realms next to the one who has all authority and that power that raised him from the dead that resulted in him being seated there has been given to me, then it's for the same purposes that he raised Jesus from the dead. To love people 
God's people everywhere and to do the good things He's planning for us to do. That's a whole lot to drink from today. That's a whole lot to take in and try to grasp and understand. Thankfully, today's not the only day we're ever going to hear the Word. Thankfully, today's not the only day we're ever going to have an opportunity to dig in and try to understand. And thankfully, God doesn't expect us to just get all this on our own. He's given us the privilege and the access to Him through prayer. So I'm going to leave you with this today. Do we have the confident hope that He has called us to be His holy people? Do we have the confident hope that we have in us the same power that power has been made available to us that raised Jesus from the dead to do the good work that He planned for us to do. Well, we're going to talk about that next week. But today I'm going to ask you, if that's a little bit beyond your reach, which it sure is mine, then there's your prayer assignment for the week. Lord, what do you mean? Really? What do you mean that that power is available to me? What do you mean for me to do those works that you planned for me? What do you mean that I can have the confident hope? What do you mean? Because Paul is thanking God that he gave this to these folks. And this applies to us as well. Lord, sometimes your word is deep. <laughs>